morning. morning. Welcome to our service this morning, and I'm glad you're joining us if you're at home. And um, if you have time, uh, please welcome each other. We're happy to have our campers back, and next week they will be sharing some stories about their camp experiences, and I look forward to that. In your bulletin, you'll also find information in about a mission trip and a swim party that's coming up. So, happy 4th of July to everybody, and let us worship. Lord, it's no mistake that we are here now. It's no mistake for those who are going to watch us online or hit that play button later. We know you have ordained this. You have brought us here. And so, Lord, speak to our heart as we lay our cares before you that we might receive all that you have for us. Go before us, O Lord. Prepare our way. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. And our first hymn is uh, God of the Ages. And if you are, and as you are able, let's stand and join together. It's on 698 in the hymnal, if you like to look at that. And you may be seated. All right, let's talk about some joys and concerns. Dorothy Edelman's here, and she is going to be moving to French Lick. Is that correct? And this week. So make sure you speak to Dorothy today. She's just such a special person, and we love her, and we're going to miss you, Dorothy. But hopefully you'll come back and see us. Um, Galen Claudfelder has been transferred to Deaconess Hospital in Evansville. And um, he was needing some meds that they didn't have here at Good Sam. Uh, so they've transferred him down there. And um, keep him in your prayers. Judy Strait continues to receive physical, th physical therapy at a rehab facility in Newburgh. 
Keep Leah Bland and Faye Bilski in your prayers as they continue to rehab from their strokes. And a big joy, Bob Freeze is here today. So glad to have him back. Um, let's keep prayers um, and your prayers today. Rex Chatton, he's preaching at Sanborn, and John Hedge is at Walnut Grove. Keep those two men in your prayers as they continue to serve the Lord at other churches. In your bulletin, you'll see the prayer list. There's several names on there to keep in mind. Please take that list home with you and keep those people lifted up this week. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for freedom in our country, freedom to worship. We thank you for communion this morning and the freedom that brings us from the bondage of sin and guilt through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that we are in a church that allows all of us to come to the table this morning, regardless of our background, whether we're church members or not, we're thankful for that grace and that freedom. Lord, we just thank you for everything that you've given to us. And as my granddaughter says in her simple prayer, God, thank you for everything and bless everyone. Now the prayer that our Lord taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now let's prepare ourselves to give unto the Lord of our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
Almighty God, we thank you once more for the wonderful blessings, Lord, that you have filled our lives. And, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to give unto you. Bless and multiply this service and this offering to your building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And if the children like to come down now, I believe Patty's got a little something to uh, share with you this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Jeremiah. Come on, Roman. I won't bite. Boy, I like those shades. Those are cool. I think everybody must be out celebrating today. There's what? There's my potato buddy. Did you eat all those potatoes? No, okay. Well, okay, here comes some more. Very good. Now, everybody's wearing red, white, and blue today. What holiday are we celebrating today? Fourth of July. Fourth of July. Uh, what do we celebrate at Christmas? Um, that is actual ornaments. It is ornaments. Okay. Whose birthday is it on Christmas? Jesus. That's right. So whose birthday is it on the 4th of July? Does anybody know? Your birthday's on the 4th of July? Is your name? Okay, is your name America? No. Okay, well, today we're going to celebrate the birthday of America. I'm going to put that right there in case somebody forgets, all right? So, the birthday of America. So, a long, long time ago, I mean really long, in 1776, some guys got together. And they did this thing called the Declaration of Independence. That's a big word, isn't it? Does anybody know what it means? Ooh, I was hoping you'd tell me because I'm not sure I know. Anyway, there was these guys that got together and signed this piece of paper that said we could be free. Now, if you check those names really closely on that piece of paper, you'll probably find Herschel Beal and Rocky Thacker, but... But anyway, today we're going to celebrate the birthday of America. So, if you'll hold this flag up for me, what colors does that flag have on it? Red, white, and blue. Okay, what does the red stand for? Does anybody know? Why did they make red, white, and blue? Why didn't they make green and white like Lincoln? But anyway, they made it red, white, and blue. The red stands for courage. That means all the men and women that went uh, to war and fought for our country, it's for their courage. And the white, the white is for purity. What does purity mean? You don't know. Well, let me tell you. It means that we're all going to do what is right. You know what to do what is right? Okay. And the blue, the blue is for justice. Now, justice means that everyone is treated fairly and treated right. No bullies. Okay. So, what does that flag have to do with the Bible. Courage, that's right. Um, get the right card here. Okay, the red, the red stands for Jesus' blood. In other words, in Hebrews, in the Bible, it says that Jesus gives us our forgiveness. And the white, the white is kind of like the purity. It means that we, when we give our heart to Jesus, that he's going to wash us whiter than snow. And that's in Corinthians. Do you ever read Corinthians? Okay, well, it's in there, trust me. And the blue, the blue is for God's faithfulness. That means that God is faithful to us and he forgives our sins. Now, one thing I'm going to tell you about real quick I know you guys don't know who it is, but there's a lot of people out here in the audience that knows a man named Red Skelton. Now, Red Skelton grew up right here 
in Vincennes, Indiana. And he was a comedian. Do you know what a comedian is? Do I? Okay, a comedian is somebody who tells jokes and gets paid big bucks. So he came out when he was in the fifth grade. He had a teacher that said, you know what, every day, every day at school, do you, do you recite the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag. Everybody say that? You know that one? Well, he, his teacher said, you know what, you boys and girls say this every day, but I don't think you know what the meaning of it is. So we're going to talk about the Pledge of Allegiance real quickly. It says, I pledge allegiance. So I, what does I mean? You. Me. I, by myself, I. What's it mean to pledge? That means that you make a promise, right? Yes, to the United States of America. Now, the United States of America, what is that? It's our country where we live, isn't it? Yes, so um, do you know what another name for the flag is? Old Glory. Now, united, what does united mean? It means we all come together, doesn't it? States of America. Now, the states of America, we talk about America as a country. So what would the states be? You know, there's Illinois and Indiana and Michigan, and there's even Kentucky. Iowa. And Iowa, that's right. That's a state. You got it. In other words, the country is a big, America is a big country, and it's divided up. You know, it's just like with Knox County. We have uh, Big Nolan, Freelandville, and we have Monroe City, and we even have Fritchton and Iona. But they're all little c communities right in one big country. So, to the republic for which it stands. That is a big one, isn't it? Do you know what that means? You like my dress. Oh, I love your dress. In other words, the republic for which it stands means that we look around and it's our government. It's like our president, vice president, governor, mayors, you know, president of the PTO. I guess it's PTA now. Anyway, with liberty. Oh, wait a minute, I left one. One nation under God. Now you notice that under God is in the Pledge of Allegiance and that means that it's blessed by God. With liberty, with liberty means freedom, the power to do what you want. It means that we can go to school and we can come to church without being. And for all, now what does for all mean? Is that just for older adults out here? No. What does for all mean? It means everybody kids and old people and in between. It means for everyone. So the next time that you say the Pledge of Allegiance, you think about what it means. And it means that God is there with us, okay? So before you go to prayer and praise time, I do have something for you. Here, I'll take this. You want to help me pass these out? I have some hats for you. Okay. I have blue, red, and white. Which one do you want? What one you want, Jeremiah? Blue. Okay. Did everybody get one? Roman, you want one? Sure, you take one back to your, to your grandma and have her put it on. Here, your grandma would like this. There you go. That's right. Oh, you look so cute. You want one? You sure? Positive? Okay. Okay, let's have a word of prayer, and then you can go to prayer and praise time, all right? Let's fold our hands. Dear Lord, thank you for this helping us celebrate the, our Independence Day, our 4th of July, that we have the freedom to come to church and celebrate God. These things we ask in your name. Amen. You're welcome. Shelly, anything you want to share about this song before we sing? All right, a little something new for you. Uh, Shelly and I are going to share this with you called No Longer Slaves, uh, in reference to sin, of course. 
And uh, for those that know it, feel free to sing along. And uh, the, the chorus is quite simple, so you can always jump in wherever you like. Other than that, enjoy it. Listen to the words. So if you've got your Bibles with you this morning, we want to go back to the book of Romans. Last week, as we were looking at these verses, we were talking about glory over suffering, that the glory that God brings us is greater than any suffering we might endure in following the Lord. And I was so excited to share that message with you that I actually read right through all the text we were going to go over today. And so nobody's disappointed. We're going to go back over it again. But we have some new things to share in this regard. We know that through Christ we've been justified, we've been glorified. And no matter what things that we suffer, we know that God's glory is going to be greater. And so Paul continues here in chapter 8 of verse 31 of the book of Romans. And he says this, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. And who is it that can condemn us for our faith and living for Christ? No one. Because it is Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. 
whatever we face, wherever we go, no matter what is going on, God is there to intercede on our behalf. It behooves us, of course, at that point to be working in the same direction that the Lord is and not arguing with him about what we want to do and what we don't want to do. Rather, as we mentioned last time, to humble ourselves and say, yes, Lord, send me. I'll do whatever you want. I'll be whatever you want. I'll go wherever you want. Just tell me. He intercedes for us. So he's going to empower us. He's going to strengthen us. He's going to equip us so that we can do all of these things. So who then will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? Those things have separated some from the Lord. Why? It's not because God wasn't there. It wasn't because Christ wasn't there. It was because we felt defeated. We thought, oh, something bad happened to me, and therefore God must not be with me, so I'm just not going to care what God wants anymore. God didn't answer a prayer I had given, and so I'm not going to follow the Lord anymore. It happens. Folks with little faith. There was an interesting observation made. I don't know who made it, but it does make an awful lot of sense. It should not surprise anybody at all, especially Christians, that in a fallen world where sin is alive and well, that we should be surprised at all when people sin. Think about that. Well, I can't believe they're doing this. Why not? It's a shame when people sin, that's for sure. But we should never be surprised that it's happening. Hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. These are just some of the things that we will face. But these are also the things that will be the crucible that God will bring us through to refine us. Every battle God gets us through, we get stronger, we get tougher, we get sharper. We are more prepared for the next event that we're going to face. And that takes us through valleys, it takes us over mountains. But in all of it, God is there and his love is not, it cannot be separated from us. And as long as we keep looking to him, we won't be uh, disappointed because he will be there. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Folks, that's you, that's me. We are more than conquerors. We're not just overcoming things. We're not just finding, uh, you know, beating little things going on in our lives. Because the glory of Christ is in us, because his Holy Spirit is in us, we become more than those who just overcome things. We become his children we become living examples of what God is doing. And if you've ever seen anybody that has overcome things through Christ, and you've seen the strength of God in them, you've seen their faith, and it inspired you, that's more than just overcoming because it's helping other people grow as well. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced... And we talked about this uh, last week. Paul wasn't just guessing. He was convinced that neither life nor death nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. Think for a moment the events in your life that you have lived through. Think of some of the difficult things you have had to deal with in your lifetime, whether as an individual, as a family, as a community, as a church, as a country. Do 
death, life, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. In all of those things that you went through, did God ever stop loving you? Was the hand of God ever not right there waiting to lift you up out of the mud and the mire, to lift you up, to set you on solid ground, to help you through the power of the Spirit be the victor? Even in those moments when it feels like we've lost, we're still the victor because we've grown. Christ has filled our hearts with strength. It's not victory as determined by what the world thinks is the victory, but it's a victory of Christ. The victory that goes beyond what the world sees. As each of us, you and I, grow in our faith, as we share that gospel, as somebody new is inspired, if somebody new comes to know Christ, that victory continues to grow. See, the world doesn't see that stuff. And sometimes we don't see it because we're not looking. But we can be more than conquerors. Now, what's it take to be a conqueror? I'm going to make the camera case. I'm going to get a drink real quick. I'll be right back. <clears throat> we know without a doubt that with Christ on our side, we are going to be more than conquerors. Through Christ, we are, as we've said, able to overcome all things. But what does it take to be a conqueror? So we know God is going to do his thing. Jesus is going to do his thing. The Holy Spirit is going to be there to equip us and empower us. <clears throat> but what about for you and I? What is our job in all of this? What made Jesus a conqueror in all he faced? Sure, he was the son of God. I love it when people like to say that, well, he was Jesus, he was the son of God, he was able to do anything he wanted. Jesus faced temptations just like you and I do. You've heard those sermons, and you'll probably hear them again. He was in the flesh. He understood what it was to be hurt. He understood what it meant to suffer loss. He knew what it meant to watch other people suffer. And he knew what it meant when it came to deciding, am I going to be obedient to my father? And his final answer, as you all know, not my will, but your will be done. So let's take a look <clears throat> at some of the key moments in Jesus' life. So we can maybe get a little glimpse of an understanding of what we can do to be conquerors. So consider Jesus as a boy visiting the temple. The, this is following the Passover celebration. Mary, Joseph, and many of their kinsmen are returning to their homes. A day into the journey, they realize Jesus is missing. It's a big caravan. It's filled with a lot of their family. It wasn't unusual for the kids to be off doing their thing. If you've ever had teenagers and been to a park, a mall, you know what that's like. Yeah, we'll see you later, Dad. Bye. I'm out. <laughs> I don't want to be seen walking with you in public. <laughs> Anybody been there? <laughs> so they, they, it's a day later. They realize he's gone. They travel back to Jerusalem. Now they're in Jerusalem, and for three days, they're looking for him. It wasn't a small city. <clears throat> three days and so in Luke chapter 2, verse 48 through 51, here's what happens. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching you in great anxiety. And he said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. 
And then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother treasured all of these things in her heart. Being more than a conqueror requires then a deep desire. All right, hear this, people. It requires a deep desire on our part to know God. Not just to know about God, not just to hear about God, but to know God. And so Jesus was in the temple. He was listening. He was learning. He was sharing. He was worshiping. When he had an opportunity to be in the presence of God in the temple, to worship and to pray, he was there. It wasn't an option. Worship wasn't something he did just when he had an opportunity. It wasn't about worshiping when it was convenient. Oh, I can't go to church. I got family coming today. Invite him to church. If not, tell him you'll see him when you get home. The door is open. Help yourself. I'll be back. I'm going to go be with the Lord. We got all kinds of reasons why we don't worship. But do we have that deep desire to know God? Because if we do, our actions will follow. Do we put in the time? Do we put in the effort? Number two, Jesus was prepared for his ministry. And he prepared for it. To begin his ministry, Jesus was baptized and then led by the Spirit into the wilderness, tempted by Satan for 40 days. And it tested his knowledge of God, and it empowered him. All that time he spent knowing God helped him get through this. Luke chapter 4, verse 1, and the first part of 2. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led then by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. So he was baptized, he was filled with the Spirit, the Spirit then led him into the wilderness to be tempted, and then if we go down to verse 14 in Luke chapter 4, it says this, then, and this is following the temptation, where he did not submit to Satan, then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. So being Filled with the Spirit and then empowered by the Spirit. It could be two different things. But here he is now, filled with the power of the Spirit. So being a, more than a conqueror requires us uh, being filled with the Spirit. It requires us to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And again, that's an intentional thing that we are receiving and then using. If I want to get stronger by lifting weights, if I don't actually lift any weights, and I'm just, you know, doing curls here, you know what this is? This is therapy after you break your arm. <laughs> Second grade, folks. That's what I was doing. And my arm's still kind of weird. But here's the thing. If we don't put any weight on that, if we don't exercise that which we give, that we're given... We're not going to be empowered. So, we have to put that to work. Number three, Jesus begins his ministry. Matthew chapter 4, 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee. Now, again, he's empowered, filled with the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. He's been in touch with God. He knows the Lord. And so he went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. Now, I know somebody's going, now, wait a minute. That's Jesus. That's what God wanted him to do. I can't do all that. Wrong. First off, you can. And not because you're good at it. It's because the Spirit of God can do all things. The same Spirit that filled Christ is the same Spirit that fills us. And so those things can still happen. Are we all called in the same way? No. Are we all called to witness in the same way? No. But we can all share, we can all pray, and things will and do and can happen. Being more than a conqueror requires us using what we know 
Hence the reason why we're spending time knowing God, so now we've got something we can share. It requires us using what we know and what we've received, the power of the Spirit, and then sharing it. Sharing it with somebody. Anybody, somehow, somewhere, some way. Every last one of us have to be sharing what God has given us with someone else. It's that simple. And it's not difficult. Because if you know it, it's already a part of you. And it's easy to share the things that are a part of you. Number four, Jesus fully relied on prayer to be prepared for all he did, for all he faced. After healing a man with leprosy, many people began following after Jesus to hear him speak and see his miracles. Meanwhile, his habit was to intentionally make time for prayer. So Luke 5, 15 and 16. But now, more than ever, the word about Jesus spread abroad. Many crowds would gather to hear him and to be cured of their diseases. But he would withdraw to a deserted place to pray. Chapter 6, verse 12 and 13 of Luke. Now during those days we went out to the mountain to pray. He spent the night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose 12 of them, whom he also named apostles. So in order to prepare... In order to know what to share, in know, in, to know in this second case who to call as his, as his apostles, Jesus prayed. So being more than a conqueror requires intentional and ongoing prayer. To be prepared for whatever then God would have us to do. Ongoing, intentional prayer. And how many of us can say, my prayer life is everything I want it to be? Or do we more often say, yeah, I really need to spend more time praying? Folks, we all know we make time for the things we want to do. For the things that we make a priority in our life, that's what we make time to do. Is prayer important? Is sharing important? Is being more than a conqueror important? Number five, Jesus fully embraced the the necessity to deny his own will. Ruh, ruh, here it comes. Now, he fully embraced the necessity to deny his own will in order to follow God's will. How many of us love doing that? I don't want to do what I want. I want to do what Jesus wants. Matthew, uh, consider this prayer of Jesus shortly before his betrayal and arrest. And again, we know this, Matthew 26, 29. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not my will, not what I want, but what you want. Not my will, but your will. See, even Jesus was tempted to go, you know, God, this is, you're asking a lot right here. And we all have those moments when God is asking a lot of us. But do we step in and embrace it? Or do we jump back and go, ooh, that's a little too much. Maybe God will use somebody else. Maybe God wants to use you. Jesus lived it, and it's also what he taught his disciples in Matthew 16. 24 through 26, he told his disciples this. If any want to become my followers, okay, guess what, folks, that's us. If any of us wants to be a follower of Christ, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? But if we want to be a follower of Christ, then we need to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and say, this is what I have to do. 
This is what God calls me to do. This is what he calls me to be. And if the world thinks that's weird or odd or strange and rejects me, then that's okay. I would rather be on the side of Christ than on the side of the world. I would rather have God saying, well done, faithful servant, than the world standing up and applauding. Oh, look at that. They're just like us. We. Being more than a conqueror requires surrendering our will and accepting God's will. Number six, Jesus obeyed God and God alone. In John chapter 8, verse 28 through 30. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will realize that I am he and that I do nothing on my own. But I speak these things as the Father has instructed me. And the one who has sent me is with me, and he has not left me alone, for I always do what is pleasing to him. And as he was saying these things, many believed in him. Standing up for our convictions, speaking without being ashamed about the blood of Christ and the message of salvation, these are things that people will notice. And though some will reject, if one accepts, isn't that worth all the trouble that you might have to go through? And Jesus also requires of this of all who follow him in John 8, 31 through 38. Jesus said to the Jews who have believed in him, if you continue in my word... So we're kind of going back to where we started here, knowing him, being in worship and hearing. If you continue my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If you want to know the truth, you've got to be in the word. If you're going to be in the word, you've got to be in worship. If you're going to be in worship, we've got to willingly say, Lord, I'm going to do everything I can to be in your word as often as I can, in public, in private, wherever I am, I want to know more. Very, if you continue my word, you're truly my disciples. You will know the truth. The truth will make you free. And then he answered him. We are, they answered him, I should say. Well, we are descendants of Abraham, and we've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, you will be made free? And he answered them, very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are descendants of Abraham, yet you look for an opportunity to kill me because there's no place in you for my word. Is there room in your heart for the word of Christ? I declare what I have seen in the Father's presence. As for you, you should do what you have heard from the Father. So by getting to know Christ, by praying, by listening, by being filled with the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, listening to God, He is going to give us what we need to say and do. We don't have to wonder, what's God going to, how am I going to do this? How can I say, how can I answer? Trust in the Lord. Use that empowerment of the Holy Spirit and share whatever it is God's laid on your heart. I will guarantee you what you need to know, you've already seen in the scripture. You've already read it. You've already prayed it. If you're reading and you're praying. I declare what I have seen in the Father's presence. As for you, you should do what you have heard from the Father. So being more than a conqueror requires being obedient to God in all things. Being more than a conqueror requires being obedient to God in all things. Not just sometimes, not just when it's easy, not just when it's convenient, but at all times. Number seven, Jesus understood following God's will required him to do hard things. He understood that following him required him to do hard things. And unless God has asked you to be crucified, 
to be utterly rejected, beat within an inch of your life, and nailed to a cross. But I'm guessing whatever you hard thing God wants you to do, it's not quite as hard as this. Matthew 20, verse 17 through 19. While Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside by themselves and said to them on the way, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and on the third day he will be raised. I think if I was hearing this for the first time, that last few words I'd have probably missed altogether. You're going to what? Oh, no, 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 this can't be good. Matthew 19, verse 29. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or fields for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Again, Jesus is talking to his disciples because they're asking, hey, what's going to happen to us? You know, what, what, what are we going to get? And he goes well beyond them. Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or fields for my sake will receive hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So family, work, if those things are first in our life rather than Christ, then we haven't set those aside to follow him. If we follow him first, I'll guarantee he's going to make sure we have what we need to take care of those other things. Being more than a conqueror requires willing sacrifice. So let's summarize all of this for a moment. Being more than a conqueror then requires a deep desire to know God. Being filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit. Using and sharing what we've received and learned. Intentional ongoing prayer. Surrendering our will and accepting God's will. Being obedient to God in all things. Doing the hard things to fulfill God's will. And it requires willing sacrifice. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, but I tell you what, if we can do this, again, through the power of, the, of Christ and the Holy Spirit, we're well on our way to being whatever it is God wants us to be. And we're well on the way of helping other people come to know who Jesus is. Jesus lived this, he taught this, and it fully demonstrated it with his life. And he gave his life on the cross to defeat death, to pay the price for our sins so that we could be saved, so that we could be delivered, so that we could be healed, so we can become more than conquerors. The question is, are we willing to do it? Now, I want to just review for you here. Just exactly what Christ did to make this all possible for us. Just to go back and look to see what he could do that through him we can do great things and be more than conquerors as well. in the vast expanse of a timeless place where silence rules the outer space. Ominously towering, it stood. A symbol of a spirit war between the one called Lucifer and the morning star, the ultimate of good. 
enveloped by a trillion planets, clean as lightning and hard as granite. A cosmic coliseum would host the end of a war between the Lord of sin and death and the omnipotent creator of man's first breath. Who will decide who forever will be the champion? Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? The greatest fight between good and evil is about to take place. The audience for the fight of the ages was assembled and in place. The angels came in splendor from afar. The saints that had gone before were there, Jeremiah, Enoch, and Job. They were singing the songs of Zion on David's heart. The demons arrived offensive and vile, cursing and blaspheming God, followed by their trophies, dead and gone. Hitler, Napoleon, Pharaoh, Capone, tormented and vexed, they grieved, waiting for their judgment from the throne. Then a chill swept through the mammoth crowd and the demons squealed with glee as a sordid, vulgar, repulsive essence was felt. Arrogantly prancing and hands held high, draped in the sparkling shroud, trolled by demons, Satan ascended from hell. The sinners groaned, the demons reeled, the devil shook with pain as a swell of power like silent thunder arose. A surge of light beyond intense illuminated the universe. In all his resplendent glory appeared the Son of God. Then a persona, yes, extraordinaire, appeared in center ring. God the Father would oversee the duel. Opening the book of life, each grandstand hushed in awe, as majestically he said, now here's the rules. You'll be wounded for their transgressions, bruised for iniquity. When he said by his stripes they're healed, the devil shook. He screamed, sickness is my specialty. I hate that healing junk. God said, you shut your face. I wrote the book. Then the father looked to his only son and said, you know the rules. Your blood will cleanse their sins and calm their fears. Then he pointed a finger at Satan and said, and I know you know the rules because you've been twisting them to deceive my people for years. Satan cried, I'll kill you, Christ. You will never win this fight. The demons wheezed, That's right. There ain't no way. And Satan jeered, You're a dead me, Jesus. I'm gonna rest you up tonight. Jesus said, Go ahead. Make my day. The bell, the crowd, the fight was on, and the devil leaped in fury. And with all his evil tricks, he came undone. He threw that jab of hate and lust, the stab of pride and envy. But the hands that knew no sin blocked every one. Forty days and nights they fought, and Satan couldn't touch him. But now the final blow, save for the final round, 
And prophetically, Christ's hands came down and Satan struck in vengeance. The blow of death fell Jesus to the ground. The devils roared in victory. The saints shocked and perplexed. His wounds appeared upon his hands and feet. Then Satan kicked him in his side and blood and water flowed. And they waited for the ten count of defeat. God the Father turned his head, his tears announcing Christ was dead. The ten count would proclaim the battle's end. Then Satan trembled through his sweat in unexpected horror yet as God started to count by saying, Ten. Hey, wait a minute, God. Nine. Nine. You're counting wrong. Eight. Eight. His eyes are Seven. Seven. His fingers are twitching. Six. Six. Where's all this light coming from? Five. He's alive. Four. Oh, no. Three. Oh, yes. He has won. He is one, he's alive forevermore. He is risen, he is Lord, he has won. He has won, he's alive forevermore. He is risen, he is Lord. Proclaim the news in every tongue through endless ages and beyond and let it be voiced from mountains loud and strong captivity has been set free and salvation bought for you and me because satan is defeated and jesus is the champion oh gracious and mighty god You won. All things have been placed under the feet of Christ who gave his all for us. May we be as willing to give our all for him. To be more than a conqueror is not just a dream. It's not just something written in a book. But it is a reality that we can each receive if we will just but say yes. To give our life for him. To make our will subsidiary, Lord, to his will. To your will alone, Lord to do those hard things, to worship, to study, to draw near to you, to be filled with the Spirit, to be empowered, to do and be everything you want us to be, to share it. We want to be more than conquerors. We don't want to be those, Lord, who sit on the stands and watch, but, Lord, we want to be those who are in the midst of the battle, in a spiritual battle where lives are at stake, eternal lives of family, friends, and neighbors, communities. And we can no longer stand idly by and let somebody else fight the good fight. Lord, where we have fallen short, where we have been tempted to stray, forgive us right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Empower us, fill us, O oh Lord. And Lord, for that one who was, who's out there that has never said, Jesus, make me whole, Lord, right now, today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Lord, May they repeat this, forgive me of my sins, oh Jesus, come into my heart, make me whole. I want to be yours and yours alone. Fill me with your spirit, empower me, and help me, Lord, to share that good news that I just heard today. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Everything 
that has ever been conquered in our life by your power, by your grace, by your presence. And may we take that next step today. Wherever we're falling short in these things, Lord, we want to turn them over to you so that we can draw near to be more than conquerors. Father, as we commune this morning, as we share in this communion, we pray that the blood of Christ, the presence of the Holy Spirit, will be in that moment so that when we come, Lord, when we take of the cup, when we take of the bread, we do remember all that you have just done. And may it be real in our heart, real in our life. And Lord, may we walk out here, walk out of this place today empowered and determined to live your will and not our own. Wherever we need strength in Lord, strengthen us. We ask that in the name of Jesus. And Father, we pray, Lord, for these elements this morning. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ. We pray, Lord, for your blessing upon them. Remembering on the night of your betrayal how you took the bread and giving thanks, you broke it and said, this is my body which is given. And likewise, after the meal, Lord, you took the cup and giving thanks, said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and eat and drink as often as you will in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, this morning we do partake and we do remember and ask, ask, ask that you would strengthen us, equip us in Jesus' holy name to be your disciples, to be your followers, to be more than conquerors through him who loves us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As I mentioned in the prayer, this is our opportunity to respond to whatever it is God is doing in your heart this morning. So as you take, please take time if you want. You can spend some time here at the altar. Uh, make that commitment to God. Give him praise for those things he's done. So if those are going to help serve, if they would come forward now. They're back there preparing their hands as well. I could just get you all to kind of half circle here. Let's see. I'll bring you each the bread, and then we'll come by with the juice, the body of Christ given for you. And as you receive it, you may eat and drink the blood of Christ poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And the blood of Christ given for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. The blood of Christ. The blood of Christ. Of sins. The blood of Christ poured out for you. We'll just go ahead and put the cups back in there.
I would remind you that this is not a United Methodist table, but the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. So all who call upon Christ as their Savior are welcome to come and partake and receive. And once the servers are in front of you, you may come start from the front row and work your way, leave out on your right aisle and return on your left as you're looking to the front. Communion to you, please put your hand up and our servers will come and find you. Is there any who have not been served that need us to come back to you? Almighty God, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. 
and we dedicate ourselves to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. On our final closing hymn this morning, another opportunity just to praise the Lord for all he has done for us and for the freedom we have here in our country and a country that uh, we have freedom in. Uh, my uh, America, my country, tis of thee. Or what are we? No, wait a minute. 696, other page. 696, America the beautiful. And as you're able, let's stand. Give God praise. Give him glory. Now may God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit fill you, equip you, and empower you from now into all eternity. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Amen.